Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back, this is episode 111. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis, sitting in the captain's chair here. The guys are indulging me these next two episodes, because they know... Is that a lot? You, he needs a lot. a lot of indulgences. Uh, no, well, I mean, he's, he's, oh. he's practically a 15th century priest. <laughs> how wonderfully! No, no, no. If he were, he'd be selling them. That's well, uh, that's, yeah. how, and he's how, not doing that. How wonderfully! Well, then he's he's a 15th century uh, Venetian merchant, <laughs> that Doge needs, of Venice, the Doge so, of Venice, who needs a, a lot of indulgences from I the Pope. I suppose yeah. so. That's right. Yes, you guys do that to me all the time. How Catholic of you, you wonderful heathen! You. Uh, <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah. Uh, yes. from Martin. That's right. Absolutely. That's very, very much <laughs> so. I'm, I, I'm busy nailing the theses to the. The church door in Wittenberg. Yeah, and, so, oh yeah, we can keep on rolling here. Let's, let's do, but we want to get to what we're really supposed to be talking about. Yes, you guys are indulging me these next two episodes because it's Hemingway. Hemingway's my guy. He's my thing. He's the great... I'm not going to spoil it because we're going to talk about him as the man and the writer except next episode. But with that in mind, I said, you know, he's also one of the most quotable individuals that's ever walked the planet. And there's so much wisdom there. And I was talking to Robert in the show prep on this. The man is blunt. Yes. He is. He, <laughs> his, his being in your face about so many things is very different for us. Most of the quotes we pick don't go there. Uh, but he, Hemingway, you just can't not do that. And I think there's a refreshment. Well, not all that. of them are blunt. Not what all I three. found interesting, because they there's a definite distinctness and I think this probably is related at least somewhat to the amount of alcohol that he had been imbibing at the time oh, which was uh, considerable considerable, considerable. Yes, yes. Right. all the time some of them are very uh, very pithy some of them are very deep and then some of them are just very blunt get mm-hmm. in your face that's right so I don't know if he was more blunt when he wasn't drinking or when he was drinking, because I can see it could go either way. <laughs> well, he, he, one of but the, they have a very distinct <laughs> nature. Is what is my point? The, yeah. the type of quote, which in, the alcohol would seem to be the defining element there. I don't know for sure, but that would be my guess. He always said you're supposed to write drunk and then edit sober. Now, some say that's apocryphal because they can't really talk about that. Yeah, but it sure sounds like him from the Absolutely. quotes I've seen. There's yes. no question. That's right. It, it's kind of out there, and, we, and we, there's so many little pithy one-liners. And we've kind of prepped a lot of this out. Of course, we don't know what Rob, Robert's going to do, but both Martin and I, we've already selected our things because we at least let Robert know what we're going to do. And we're not going pithy. We're going longer for both of ours, which is, you know, Hemingway had that. Sometimes it, there were brief, short little things. You know, write one true sentence. That's one of the things he's famous for saying. You know, where are you going to go with that? That's just there's so much there that you could do. That's just an example. And we've used Hemingway before. We had to check on this to be sure about a year ago. Uh, I used him already. Uh, As I say, we, but he means him. It, I, I suppose. That, yeah, it was fine enough that we could. He's, he's your Orwell. He is. As, as affecting as Orwell or Conrad is for me, Hemingway is for you. Absolutely. Yeah. That's correct. That's just, and that's one of the great things about Snakes and Otters is we each bring certain perspectives to that, to the group, and we all appreciate more when we're done. Yeah. And that's kind of how this this is supposed to work anyway, when we do it really, really well. I like to think we always do it well, but you know, some are really, really good. Hopefully this will be one of those. So we're, we've got three quotations from the master himself, Ernest Hemingway, uh, and we're just going to kind of play with that like we always do on that. And uh, I don't know, Martin, you want to go first? You want me to go first? I'll go first. You can. That sounds cool. Um, I, I came across, again, listeners, Francis is the Hemingway expert here. I really had not read him. And don't know a ton about him. So I had to do a little research to come up with something. But I came across this one, and it's so wonderfully misanthropic that I just loved it. Oh, that's oh a, if it's misanthropic, you're going with that. Yes, that's right. You're right up your alley. That's your wheelhouse, misanthrope. Yes. So it's it's definitely a, hey, you kids, get off my lawn kind of quote. So yeah. uh, it is from A Movable Feast, which is not one of his novels. It is a memoir published Posthumously, That's right, yeah. But it's built from his notebooks from when he lived in Paris in the 20s. Mm-hmm. So he had kind of this, after the war, uh, he had sort of this circle of literati and mm-hmm. artists and that, that were 
these exiles that lived the in Paris. The Lost Generation. The Lost Lo- Generation. It's where it comes from is that. And that features into one of his early, his really first big selling novel, The Sun Also Rises. Yes. It's, it's kind of a, all about, that's a story about what they did, but this is all the stuff he collected. Right. So he's having dinner and drinking wine with all of these artists and writers of this Lost Generation in Paris in the 20s, and he's keeping journals of all of this. Yeah. And... He stuffs them in a trunk in a hotel, yeah. forgets about them. Yeah. Forty years later, he's returned to Paris, and somebody says, "Hey, I think there's still a trunk that belongs to you in the basement," <laughs> and it's these journals. Wow. And he begins collecting them prior to his death uh, into this memoir, "A Movable Feast." And so I just I love this one. It's when spring came, even the false spring. There were no problems except where to be happiest. The only thing that could spoil a day was people. (laughs) And if you could keep from making engagements, each day had no limits. People were always the limiters of happiness, except for the very few that were as good as spring itself. So I I just love that one because it's, it's this thing of, you, for an introvert... Only the special people give you energy. As I like to put it, people wear me out. Yes. Well, that's right. People wear me out, Uh especially when you're in kind of a service and, you know, tech support kind of, you know, well, have you rebooted yet? I was going to say, if you didn't say it, I was going to. (laughs) Although, you know, I find that I almost never have to ask that. Sometimes I'll say, well, you didn't need to reboot that. that This is not, but okay, fine. Yeah. Don't stop doing that, but just you didn't have to this yeah. time. <laughs> yes, your PC is making audio. You just have to put your headphones on. And yeah. you have to plug them in. Well, they're already plugged in. That's why it's not making audio. Well, sometimes the speakers. If you turn the volume up. <laughs> yeah. So And then you get it, what it's volume? Just, <laughs> it's this wonderful sense of, you know, spring in Paris is so awesome. If only you could get us to get away from the people. Uh, except for those very special Snakes and otters, friends yeah. that that make a spring day awesome. There's an irony to that: is that you, you know, the, the introvert in you that's kind of that's what Hemingway's kind of speaking about here, loves people, but only a, in small, specific doses. Yeah, yeah. You can't take it, it's, it's it's information overload in many respects. All the rest of the people, yeah, and some of it's because they're uncontrollable. Some of it is because they're in Hemingway's case. Not as intelligent as he is. Uh, he yeah. didn't have anything to talk to him about. And this, this Those he could talk to, he right. loved. But that's most, the hard part, not to not appear elitist. That's right. But at the same time go, look, I'm horrible at small talk because I just don't find it stimulating. Right. I get bored with small talk I, because I can't it's do it. I, I can't do it. You know, when you talk about uh, the some people in small doses, I... That's true. Although, as you know, we can sit around for hours on end. That's true. It's not necessarily small doses. It's Martin. You put it a great way. Uh, you know, to, or maybe it was Francis. I, hang on, hitting hitting double nickel in eight days. So you know, my memory's <laughs> going. So that's right. Um, you know, when we talk about whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you know, introverts do not get energized by being around other people, whereas extroverts do. But I think it's not that simple. I think introverts do get energized by other people. It's which people yeah. and how. Yeah. That's and when I, mean. I think about people, it's it's the small talk is a great example. If I'm around a bunch of people that I have no common interests with, yeah, I just want to leave. Yeah, can't, you know, can't, can't I can't handle that. Yeah. I get bored. Um, I need to be intellectually engaged. That's you know, true. Yeah, and Hemingway I, would agree with that. that I have to be around people, even if it's somebody that I totally disagree with. If, which is nearly impossible right now, I can find somebody that is willing to talk and have an intellectual discussion about the things we disagree with, I can become great friends with that person. Mm-hmm. But if it's just going to be a bunch of screeching back and forth about how you're evil and wrong... Yeah. Then I have absolutely no interest in that or, because there's no depth to that. Or that they parrot the talking points, and that's all. Well, they can yeah, do. it's essentially it's nowadays that's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, if you can't hit the why, then I have no interest in that. Uh, yeah. I'll, you know, because to me, the why leads to the how to fix. Because if you know the why, you can fix it. At least that's the way I think. It. You know, 
And the springtime are those is that small group of people that you can engage. Yeah. And it's interesting you would say you use the term fix, because that's for as much as our political system claims to want to fix things, they don't. They really don't. No, it's just they the, want to the self perpetuate things, the problems. Yeah, the more things are broken, the more fundraising you can do. Yep. And the more fundraising you can do, the more elections you can win, and the more you can just keep on riding that. Yep. Stay in power. Yeah. yeah. Because power is a means to wealth, absolutely. Always has been, always will. Right, and it's, you know, well, like T.J. O'Rourke says, itself. if politicians were honest, they'd come out and say, I'd like to be elected senator to get back at all of my high school uh, classmates who called me fish face. Right. <laughs> you know, they, they always come out, with, well, I want to serve, and... Uh, but no, you... you you the people in power doesn't work that way. Yeah, you, well, people you who truly want, want to serve almost never are electable, yeah. and that's the sad thing, you know. Yeah, yeah that's that's true. Because, well, the, the altru altruist the altruistic don't go into power seeking uh, things. Yeah. They just, well, the it, problem it, is they're honest about what's wrong and what needs to be done to fix it. That is not electable. No, <laughs> yeah. no, because if you're always trying to, the people that run anymore are trying to fill a void yeah. in their selves and it, it reminds me of uh, Tombstone and that great discussion between Doc Holliday and uh, Wyatt Earp about Johnny Ringo mm -hmm. he's got a great big hole through the middle of him and he can never steal enough or kill enough or hurt enough to fill it Yeah, that's, and unfortunately that is the feeling of politics right now all these people are they just have massive holes and they, they can never lie enough to fill that hole up yeah, because it's all about. They think power fills it. They think power will 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 heal it, and mm -hmm. uh, and there's got to be exceptions to this. There's just got to be. Odds are, but I ain't seeing that. Uh, it's well, so part of the problem is, and again, we're getting a little bit far afield here. Yeah. But part of the problem with that is that everybody's favorite politician is the one that they think is truly altruistic. But honestly, I have not seen a politician that is truly altruistic. Well, you may have them starting out the local level, but it's damn hard to stay that way. And move on. Well, altruism too can can kind of be a, a false na narrative too, because that means you're bringing home the bacon for your people. Well, that's true. And In today's society, that is very true we because mean? we are so tribalized. Yeah. What have you done for me lately? That's yeah. that's what it really yeah. kind of goes to. So that's which is another reason why people wear me out. <laughs> it's yeah, not at all where I wanted to go with that quote. I just wanted to celebrate the people who are as good as spring itself. Yeah. Well, well you, you know, know you know cuz yeah, let's let's but talk But it makes about us positive. appreciate the people who are spring itself even more. Yeah. Because it is so hard for us to find them. And, and you know, maybe for extroverts it's not as true. And I'm not saying that extroverts aren't deep or can't be deep. But I think the introvert tends towards that more so. Uh, because introvert it's Still. not that we are inward looking, but it's just that we are comfortable in our own minds. Yeah. Not that, again, that extroverts aren't, because nobody's 100% one way or the other. That's right. But I think the introvert tends to be the deeper thinker because we have more time in our own head without other people interfering. Yeah. Uh, I was just telling the fellows earlier, uh, awesome week. I got a whole vacation coming up all the way through the holiday, and we're not going anyplace. All I plan to do is sit on my couch with Wilson the Wonder Doodle and my books. Yeah, I got okay. a couch. I got a dog. I got books. Well, I'm set. You That's might right. consider borrowing some Hemingway then, because you can blow through him very quickly. Oh, yeah. but I got such a huge shelf. I, know, I, I got know. Dan Jones with Getting the Templars. I got to read, and I got. I know. A you can sneak in. He's, he's got some short stories, right? Oh, absolutely. So yeah, you, you can sneak in a short a story. Jaro, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a uh, he. He wrote probably more short stories than he did novels. Yeah. Uh, well, that's back in a time when short stories was an acceptable way to be a writer. Well, that's right. And well, he, they would be serialized a lot, too. Yeah. That's, that's how he would get Yeah, there were, there were outlets for that. Yeah, yeah. nowadays there aren't. It's you, you go for, They go for the blockbuster. Although nowadays the short story writer is often the guy who ta or woman who takes his novel and serializes it into a much shorter Kindle Select or uh, shorter uh, set of books that, you know, if you took all of these, cleaned it up, watched your grammar... And we're just a little bit clearer. You could make this into two or three, four hundred page novels instead of ten, hundred and fifty page novels. Yeah, you know, which I'm not, nothing wrong with that because you know you do what you can, and, and some people want to read 
the short, quick novels, which is fine. That's what yeah, short stories were for but, at one point. And, and Hemingway was a master of that. Yes, Snows of Kilimanjaro is a great, great choice. Great choice. It's one of one of his very, very best. He had, he had. Well, I'm not going to get off on Hemingway just yet. You know, but he had some stinkers here and there. And, of course, and every then, writer does, and, and he hated those because he. And every writer does, especially when they when he didn't think they were, and the critics came back and just bashed him. It happened a couple times. And it's like, ooh, you know. And this yes. is after he is Hemingway. So, you know, he's got a large big target on his face. And this, uh, the, the quote that you gave here, like I say, this was not written for publication. You know, it's, it's a journal and stuff like that. So you're getting the real guy and his real thoughts with that. And it's, I like to think that this is kind of a encapsulation of the joys of hospitality. You know what I mean? <laughs> because you're with your, your peeps. You know, sitting around a table. Look at Francis being all hip. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Hey, it works. He, he, he was, he was said, peeps. If he'd been, if he had said tribe, it would have been even better. Oh, you know? I don't think I can do that. That's a negative connotation for me. But uh, it, yeah, you're sitting around. You're sitting around a table in your ballet, drinking your fresh wine with all your friends in the cafe. You know, that's that's what Hemingway was doing. Eating French bread. That's right. Drinking fr- French wines in Peru and. Eating French fries. That's right. French also, dressing. And French dressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah. We are just awful. Better off, French, Dad. Our, our, Love it. That's right. Our, our French. Oh. That's right. I mean, you can only imagine what Paris in the 20s well, yeah, because was really... Was, I mean, this is what we have are these, you know, these, these I, snapshots I that, from, the, from this circle. But you think about post-war or interwar Paris... And how glorious it must have been. Well, yeah, because you lived. The only equivalent to that would have been the 1870s, 80s, 90s. You know, the 1875 to 1885-ish, give or, give or take yeah. a little 1890, is when you had people like Van Gogh living in France and yeah. painting You know, the, all of the artistic movement as opposed to the writer's movement. Yeah. Uh-huh. That was in the Lost Generation. Oh yeah, it's art, art too. But I mean, yeah, I mean Paul Klee is yeah. part of Hemingway Circle. So there, there's artists, there's writers. There's, yeah. Uh, well, Gertrude Stein was one of his. Yeah. One of his. So folks I mean, it's, and, it's uh, critics and and nonfiction people and and these novelists. It's it's a really neat circle. Oh yeah, yeah. he was a journalist actually at the time. That's what most of these people. That's what put you know enabled him to pay kinda, rent. Yeah, kind of on the map. Yeah, and and let them be out there. But you know, novelists. Were kind of weren't much of a thing. He didn't really. That kind of came later for him, but he was already writing a bunch of stuff like that. So, getting this peek into his, you know, reality, and this was early Hemingway. A lot of that jadedness hadn't happened yet. Well, you know, you know this could have been. This is another example of you know. Well, was it since his journal during you know all this time? Was it you know when he was under the influence of the wine? Because yeah. made him deeper think. You know, maybe the blunt stuff really is when he's sober and cranky. Well, and there's and he never he had he ended up getting like two concussions throughout his life that really a lot led to the mental illness things that he got later in life and that was a cumulative thing that happened later. That was later. That but was he a, had been the plane one, crashes in Africa. Absolutely, that was Oof. that was just one of like three that happened. Uh, but this is also post his wounding. This person yes. one. So yeah. he has had his you know requisite suffering and it was huge. Uh, this was, I don't know when this actually came from, the date that, you know, that they're stealing from here, but it is probably prior to, I'm guessing here, A Farewell to Arms, which was kind of his yeah. you know, regurgitation of all that war experience. This is probably more like uh, The Sun Also Rises, which was all about that post-war experience. It was very, it had its optimistic levels, but it was also lost is the best word for it. Uh, aimless in many ways. We mm-hmm. just kind of do our thing, and uh, what we do is good, like he says in the quote. But it's kind of like, still, what's the point? Yeah, and they're coming to grips with a world that's been destroyed. Yeah, and that they somehow survive. There's a survivor's guilt to this. Yeah. It's huge. There's there's a PTSD yeah. and a survivor's guilt going on. It's not unlike again the the earlier period. You know, you're talking about after the Franco-Prussian War, yeah. and you know. War breeds a lot of things, and for those who survive it, if assuming that you are, uh, you know, not in a totally occupied, destroyed, you know, if your culture can still exist afterwards, like in these times, um, you know, this creativity I think is a response to that. Mm-hmm. Well, like Nietzsche, I mean, that's it, that's the crucible he had for his stuff was after that Franco-Prussian War. And all the changes in Germany that went through it, it went in a different direction, of course. It was philosophical, not literary. 
nevertheless, they're still two giants yeah. that were forever affected by those things that went on around them. Anything major that happens like that is obviously going to affect you. The thing that war does, it affects the entire culture at once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have we oh. sufficiently yes, pummeled that? Yes, that was awesome. Okay. That was okay. awesome. Okay. So I was, I'm handing off the baton to Francis and let him run with his. Yeah, well, you know, if you were to Google Hemingway quotes, you will get literally thousands upon thousands. You have to categorize them. To I'm really now get... going to have to go compile all of the ones that have come up my Google list and see how many thousands upon thousands I actually get. Only because he used the word literally. Literally. Sorry. Sorry. Well, sorry. sorry. That's right. Sorry. It's my... You know, these it, are, I it, found it, the it, early morning episodes. I am much more of a smartass than in the later episodes. Well, I mean, well, I'm and, not and it's sure a, it's that I'm not accurate here. It's a definite pet peeve, the, the correct use of the word literally. For you? Yeah, it, me uh, too. Yeah, well, I used it uh, I'm not sure it's going to be wrong. I'm not either. That's uh, why I said, no, nah, I've got to go count. Damn. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Cause My CDO says, really? Yeah. And, you're, and I'm, I'm but pretty it, well bad, you know. Right, it's, it's, because it's, his style was unique and new and different. Yeah. That's a lot of this stuff has entered the zeitgeist. Well, and as that's, as and you that's say. just from his works. Yes. His, as the personality, he was beyond larger than life. <laughs> Mark, to call him larger than life is an insult to the concept because he, he be, goes beyond that in so you many know, ways. He, just to, it, to kind of, not necessarily set the stage for the quotes, but to, just to bear in mind, because we're, we are doing the quotes before we do the discussion of the man himself, Hemingway came to his adulthood in a time when a guy could literally go to Europe and spend 10 years hanging out in France. Mm -hmm. It is damn near impossible for the modern man who is not already rich yeah. to do the kind of, these kind of things. Because even just getting an education, you have so many obligations piled upon you mm -hmm. that you are shackled to a job. Mm -hmm. It's damn near impossible to live a Hemingway life. Without having already been rich, and he was not. Yeah, I mean, he so. was living in Paris and just filing these dispatches with the newspaper that he worked for back mm -hmm. in the States and buying inexpensive wine and going to cafes and hanging out with people. Yeah, absolutely. He, he was able to make a living. No he, cell phone bill to pay. That's right. No <laughs> cable bill, no <laughs> internet bill. I mean, no, it's just, but, I mean that's a, that is a major thing that, you know, I mean, that's probably an episode itself to talk about how modern society has, in many ways, shackled people to a certain way of doing and living. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, because the, the freedom that he had to do that is impossible today. Yeah, unless uh, you already uh, uh, are independently or, or you don't mind abject poverty. You know, that's well, almost homelessness. Well, what, right? the way he lived, yes, we would consider that today to be abject poverty, yeah. practically. And yet, but, he, and yet he wanted for nothing. But he wanted for nothing. Yeah. He had friends, he had a place to go, he had a place to sleep. Yeah. But he didn't have all the creature comforts that we do. Or have. sleep it off, as some cases. Sleep it off, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, a different time, really was. Yeah. And that, I'm glad you mentioned that. Talked about you know the largeness of the man because that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Uh, and this quote of his is more. It's it's about writing, but it's really not. Uh, uh, I mean, we could go deep into just the writing stuff alone. If you, just writing his life. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, and that's that's who he was. It's the door he walks in through, and it's a wonderful thing. But all the is, best writers have wonderful things to say and write about writing. Interesting, you say that because that's exactly the quotation because, I'm going to give you. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. well I mean, you said it was going to be about writing, so but I mean, you yeah, know, I think of because I've come across many quotes of his that are about writing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, you look at Stephen King's book on writing. Yeah, he's... Uh, yeah. And, and so many others that are, you know... Stephen, his is probably one of the most popular modern books about writing. Very much so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many respects, Hemingway, uh, on the on the recent PBS special, they talked about him, the fact that Hemingway re forever rearranged all the furniture in the writing room. Uh, <laughs> and he didn't put the furniture there, but you can't... every Everything that's come after him you have to work within that setup that he set. Which is interesting because one of the things I've seen about him, said about him is that, or so, something he said rather, was probably he would say, no, 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 that was Mark Twain. Because he attributes that. everything to Twain. That's correct. I mean, there, there's a definite progression, the bluntness of Twain and that acerbic humor. Hemingway has a lot of that, but Hemingway is a lot more bitter. Yeah. In many ways, there's a lot more, whereas Twain was just, he's a bit of a smartass. Yeah, there's a lot his. of that, yeah. 
Uh, and, and Hemingway's quotes can be, too. But uh, the ones I've read so far, it seems to be a bit more... When it gets that edge, it's more of a bitter edge as opposed to a uh, uh, sticking it to you and upending your your conception of things. Disarming with humor. Yeah, yeah I, and Twain was famous for that, too. But I think Hemingway is far more polished. Oh, yes, yes. Far more yes. polished. And I think that's part of it. And that's one of the reasons it got to the point where he could throw off the quip but it would sound like he worked on it forever because so many of the arrested stuff that he did, he did. You know, if we do a Hemingway, we really ought to do a Twain pairing. Yeah, we've talked Quotes about that. And, yeah, yeah. And we are. It, it, I think I think we're gonna. That needs to be. But what we, we do one of those two, do some quotes and then add it to the do, schedule. Yeah, add yep. to the schedule. All right, give it to us, man. All right. Give it to us. I'm dying it's, here. It's, it's got. Uh, he takes forever to get to his quote. You guys know that, but it's the it's it's the journey to. It's not That's why station. it's almost why we don't let you go first. I have occasionally because it'll kill the episode. No, but not kill the episode. I don't mean in a negative way, but. Taking too much time. Yes. And we we contribute to that. So, yes. Yeah, try to really mean it. Really, that's right. I like that. That's good. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, God, the hand gestures, folks. No, no, that's you're trying to get the the blood flowing so you can get the, yeah. Yeah, that's to get the the needle in. All right. Here it is. I'm hanging fire here waiting on this quote. All right. Here it is. The most solid advice for a writer is this, I think. Now, I say this is uh, more than just for writers. Okay, that's my little proviso here. Try to learn to breathe deeply. Really to taste food when you eat. And when you sleep, really to sleep. Try as much as possible to be wholly alive with all your might. And when you laugh, laugh like hell. When you get angry, get good and angry. Try to be alive. You'll be dead soon enough. Yeah, try to be alive. You'll be dead soon. That's enough. there's yeah. that's that's the money portion of that one. Right yeah, there. I really like that. I, oh, that's God, well so, done, so, Francis. Oh, thank you. That's so Hemingway. Yeah, it's nice of you to take credit for Hemingway's quote. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it. Guys. But you picked it. You picked that's it. Right. Yes, yes. And like I say, there's thousands upon thousands we could have picked from. I didn't notice. I didn't say literally. But uh, <laughs> they. I mean, come on, try and be alive. You'll be dead soon enough. He's. It's and that's not a hedonistic thing. That's, no, no, not, that's you can take that you could take it that way. Sure, but that's not what. But that's why you I'm can take that, that in a very Catholic or, uh-huh. or or Jewish or any other faith way. That's why I like that preamble that goes with it. It explains what he means by that. It's you're su- just that's what you're supposed to do. Well, be fully alive. Experience. That's right. Because yeah, well, it's the one thing you've been given. You know, it's, it's at the heart of so much of what we've talked about. Yes. You know, it's it really is. You know, be alive because. You know, if you won't be, I mean, it, it really is. We have talked so often about being fully human, living mm-hmm. out your life to be the best. To use the cliched version now, the best version of yourself. You know, that's being as authentically you. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's be being alive, alive. Experience things. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Taste so, the food. See how food really tastes. Well, yeah, and, and See this, how that bourbon really tastes. And I like this here too because it's not relativistic. It's not, you know, just do what you want to do. It's whatever you whatever you experience in life. And it was very basic stuff here. You know, it's those those are universal. He does have some very relativistic quotes. He does though. sometimes. Does. Yeah, this one here, I don't I don't I'm not interpreting it that way. He may no, no, that. No. Um, I'm talking kind of taking the opposite approach here is that because all those things he talks about, you know, be mad. Eat the food, you know, all those things that you, that's, that's part of being alive. It is. And that's a little good thing. I think it's also, it is an insight into, I think, some of his uh, uh, other tendencies, especially when you think about the, the, the drinking and what have you, uh, in the, and, and some of the quotes that do go into that more. It's like he's got one, one thing about, uh, there is no one truth. Everything is true. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't get more relativistic yeah, than that's, that. That's, yeah. Um, and in many ways, this shows an insight into that, how you can take that being alive, mm-hmm. the way we think of it, and going and taking a right turn on it, or a left turn on it, however you want to go with that, but taking it in the wrong direction, because mm-hmm. it's a very sensualistic approach to being alive. Well, he was definitely that, that's yes. for sure. And, and many who come out of a, a, a war with the experiences he did, that's where they're going to go. Well, sure. Because you you want to know that you're alive. Sometimes that that extreme pleasure, or and for some that extreme pain, is the only way that you know you're alive, that you're real. Mm-hmm. And you got to bleed just to know you're alive. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> <Dawson. laughs> well, you know, well, Hemingway's quote, you know, he's he's talked about, you know, going down to the 
going down to the page and bleeding. That's how you write. That's kind of right. that's one of his things. You know, that to you know, write, your writing is very simple. You sit, yeah. just sit down at the typewriter and bleed. Yeah, and you said which in his and he is famous for writing from experience. That was because he had it. He had it. That's correct. Oh my God, he is and the it, living embodiment of write what you know. That's correct, and that's kind of a fallacy for many, but for him, because of what he knew, why wouldn't you? Right. You know what I mean? That's just that's just what he brought to the yeah. table, and it was unique, and it was exactly the right moment because it reflected what so many others had. That's one of the reasons Sun Also Rises is so great because it taps into it's about nothing. Yeah. It's yeah. really about nothing, uh, but it it taps into at the time what everybody that went through that and yeah. survived was experienced. Yeah, nothing it, it is just, about any everything. Everything's about nothing. Yeah, it, it just it, it's interesting way that this is in his life and his writing is you're talking about smashing together so many traditions. Mm -hmm. You're smashing together a nihilistic tradition with an Epicurean tradition and 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 just trying to fathom what life's about and and taking well I'm gonna pull this piece here and I'm gonna reject this piece here. The Stoics are garbage but the Epicureans got something to tell us and the nihilists have something to tell us and and I just that's fascinating to 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 mix all that stuff up and to think, well, this is just some guy from the Midwest, yeah, you know, in the U.S. and Michigan, yeah, yeah. No, Illinois. I know, but he spent a lot of time in Michigan. Mm. That he yeah. he considered yeah. that to be his formative place, Northern Michigan. It was kind of what they. Well, I tell you, Northern Michigan is a totally different animal than. I'm than giving you Michigan. an opening yes. here, sir, to speak of the virtues of Michigan. Well, it, it is a wonderful place, yeah. especially once you get outside the larger cities. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and, it, they, and they had a, uh, they had a summer home up there on the lake. In the, the larger, you know, Detroit at one time was a phenomenal city. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not much left of it, literally, because I've talked about it before. If you see the before and Detroit News website. We'll publish these photo montages often, and we uh, certain streets, you know, twenty years ago, ten years ago, five years ago, now, and progressively, you know, twenty years ago, nice looking street, you know, maybe some grass growing on some of the concrete in the sidewalk, you know, like any city, and then you know, next picture is oh, there's a few houses that are kind of run down, boarded up, and then the next picture, you know, some of those houses are gone, and the rest of the houses don't look really bad. Then you get to the last picture, and there's like one house left on the block, and everything else has grown over because everything else has been knocked down. Uh, but some of the architecture uh, in Detroit—you mm -hmm. know, Detroit was a grand city at one time. It really was. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was. It was. It was a cultural and architectural rival to New York and Chicago at one time. It really was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's not now. Uh, but and you know, the rest of Michigan—you know, the, the natural beauty—it's a large state. And it has wonderful, wonderful bits to it. It really does. Yeah. So I can see why a writer would get. Uh, yeah. Would get a he lot he of really that. he really talked. And in fact, his first novel, The Torrents of Spring, which was before The Sun Also Rises, it was not very successful. Uh, it talked. It was about time spent in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, and it, it's it had some Native American stories and stuff that it went with it. It was it was okay. It was good. You could tell it was very uh, embryonic for him. Uh, it wasn't as polished. As like the sun also rises, and of course farewell to arms, which is probably his biggest. It's it's the one. It was really his second or third novel, but it's the one that everybody has read. That and uh, well, that and uh, for the for whom the bell tolls, and uh, and there's there's others. Man, the man, old man of the sea was late for him. Uh, well, it, you know, maybe not everybody's read them, but certainly uh, people of our generation know the the, the titles. Those titles, you know, that's no. correct. You may probably not our kids don't know most of these titles because I doubt that he's taught as much as he was when we were. You know, There's some school. truth to that, although a lot he's kind of like the Beatles. Everybody has to kind of go through him at some point. I never really went through the Beatles. Did you really? Oh, no. Yeah, let's just say because uh, yeah, yeah. our irony of ironies. My, I went through it as a freshman in high school, and when I really discovered the Beatles, my son did the same thing when he was a freshman in high school. On my his son own, discovered it when we had the uh, Beatles rock band on the Wii, and he was playing the the guitar. I mean, he could, uh, you know, the the Wii guitar. Yeah, he could do it. He knew all those songs. Sure, oh, sure. I mean, that's, there's you know, the when when you find genius in whatever that whatever that looks like, and Hemingway certainly one of those. Uh, it's always out there. It'll it'll be out there. But anyway. We've uh, before we let you finish up. Anything else on this one? Um, no. I mean, 
I would I would sum up his quote in this way. Yeah. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. Oh, that sounds so hedonistic, though. But isn't that really a good portion of the the meat of that? Oh yeah. Oh, then you, you well, can, you but I it. think there's there's more. Yes, there is it's, more. It's but not I mean, eat, drink. It's taste, experience the food, experience the drink, appreciate it. And be fully alive. There's a presumption that you're not doing this to, to, to get away from anything else. It's you're going to do this anyway. Do it well. Yeah. It's not just yeah. a party. It's an experience. That's. I think that's exactly. It. That's well, the best parties I, are an experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. And I, I think that's a lot of it right there. I, I, I'm hoping. I, I really. Yeah. I, I see that yeah, as a the, positive. This, this, as this not a negative. Reaching back to the Greek Epicureans and and. Yeah, the sensual it's, life is it, not bad. No, it is not. In fact, with balance, with, with balance. balance, that's right. And, and that's what he's talking about. Because you notice, he's not talking. He doesn't say go out and have sex with as many people as you can, or drink until you're drunk, or any of this sort of stuff. He's talking about natural, normal things that you do. You do them with deliberation, paying attention, like you said. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what he's saying. Pay attention because you get one life, and when it's done, there's, it's there's, done. There's one shot at this. That's right. And you got and whatever you do. Do it well. Uh, do it's, not just kind yeah. of phone it in. Uh, Don't just eat chicken nuggets. Oh, that's that's pretty good. Right. There, and then there eat are, beef nuggets and lamb nuggets too. Right. <laughs> you know, there, there are better chicken nuggets than others. Of course, we yes. all know that. But yeah, it's, but there's you know, more to life than the you know they squeeze that chicken slurry out and. I think fry somebody it. like him would be appalled at. Society to what we eat. Oh yeah, and well, not just what we eat. Just I mean, in general. Yeah, uh, there's a malaise that we have. That there's a find. genericness to life yeah, yeah, that's today. Right. Yep, that is astounding when you consider the absolute humongous, just stupendous amount of options you have in everything. Hmm? Yeah, but these options are all the same damn options presented slightly different ways. Uh, well, and the standardization of our consumer experience is very post World War Two. Yes, it's it's a very deliberate that you want to have that same experience in Poughkeepsie, and in Detroit, in St. Louis, and yeah. Santa Barbara. You know that's that's why those places took off. There's a consistency to them. Well, and, and that would have been moving around. Yeah. They wanted to experience yeah. in the new place what they experienced in the old and place. And that would have been so foreign to him yeah. because there's no such thing as standardization of eateries in Paris. It's right, you know, and that's, this one's good. That's this the one's beauty of it. Terrible yeah. and because you get variety. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and life is it's it's the paradox of modern life in that it is so complex that everything is the same. Yeah. yeah, there's a. There's I mean, a, think about that. That is just. Yeah. It's, it's insane to say that you are it's, profound with that. There's a blandness right. that comes with life today, that Hemingway, I believe, we believe, would find uh, abhorrent. Yeah, yeah, that we're not I living mean, and just stultifying and and confusing. We carry the sum total sum knowledge of the entire world practically in our hands and our phones or our tablets, mm-hmm. and yet what do we do with it? We post TikTok videos, watch cat videos. That's what we do. That's worse. I think posting TikTok videos is worse than watching cat videos. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, the sum total of the human experience is in your back pocket, but you're using it to anonymously send creepy stuff. Right. To cyber stalk people and to yeah. You know, post you know inane to stupid be, insults on Twitter. Yeah. To be to be insulting of someone who's out there in the world. Yeah, something you've never met, never will meet, and you know, and using your anonymity to to disparage them. Yeah, to be an asshole, basically. Wow, that's right, man. Damn, yo, I knew Hemingway would bring out the best to us. All right, so that, that so, means it's a break, right? That's a break. So we're we're at the bourbon break. Oh, Hemingway loves bourbon. We know that all whiskey and all uh, alcoholic beverages. He was a big, big. Uh, was he specifically a bourbon fan, or did he just like? Oh, he liked it all. all he liked that. Yeah, no, he's tequila he, and rum uh-huh. and everything. Because he, you know, living in the Caribbean, yeah, yeah. See, he liked all of that. Sure, you can say you like all of it, but to say you're a bourbon fan to me means you're a bourbon. You know, you're bourbon. Yeah, no, no, he's that's, you're Rick in Casablanca. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he's. Uh, well, I don't know about that cool, but yes, because when know. Elsa came. To Casablanca, he wasn't drinking cocktails. He was drinking bourbon. Yeah, that was a time when bourbon was not a thing. I mean, not like it is now. Yeah. Yeah. 
But anyways. This will... Bless you, sir. Pardon. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry for that... uh, Allergies, people. Allergies. I do not have COVID. Sorry Sorry for that audio spike, uh, listeners. Well, we're Uh, we're talking about bourbon. Uh, Didn't I give you a splash of something in that coffee you're drinking there, Martin? Oh, Grandad. That's correct. Yeah, it's the... It's the low end, but it put a little little something in there. That's right. Well, it's, well you know, you mix it with when you bourbon. mix bourbon with something, it's to enhance something else. Yeah. You know, now if you're drinking a bourbon and coke, that which to me is the lowest form of mixing you can do. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, really, all you're doing is sweetening up your bourbon, and sometimes you put so much in it that you lose the bourbon. Yeah, which is certainly possible. Yeah. But adding it to something like coffee, to me, that is adding a flavor. Yeah, because it did. It added even old granddad has just that tiny bit of that. Caramel sweetness from the from the wood, and it, it was good. It was a, a good little caramel addition to uh, to the morning coffee because we are recording at Studio F very early in the morning. Yeah, yes. I don't think we're not going to. I don't think we're going to crack anything, but we can certainly talk about a few things. I know last episode uh, Robert talked about his uh, Father's Day gift. I've got one sitting over here on the table right here. Uh, we're not going to crack it, but we can talk about it because we'll get it next time. It's it's Russell's Reserve. Uh, straight uh, ten years old. Uh, it's fantastic. My daughter gave that to me for Father's Day, and that's yeah, any bourbon aged more than four years really starts getting into good quality. Oh, see, that's that's what to me a minimum is. is six, and if you can get closer to ten, so much the better. Anything so, above that, you're really oh, talking. Yeah, good yeah so that you know that's that one's on our list. We've never done that one before, too. So uh, just kind of yeah. tease everybody. Russell's with Reserve, it. ten year old. Yeah. You know, this is going to be good stuff. Listeners, auto good rights. Good. I think one of the things that uh, I, I want to give you guys an assignment. Because I think this is something that would be better for them. Don't you think? So, yes. So, Auto Rights, go through all of our episodes. Give you a chance to relive the, the great moments. And compile a list of all the bourbons we've talked about. For those of you that are really industrious... Try them? Count them. Well, count them. Yeah, well, how many focus times on we, ones we've actually tried. In yes, not just talked about. Tried. Tried. Well, Cause... actually, no, no, no. Talk about the word. List all of it. So, ones we've tried... How many, and ones, then which ones we've talked about. And which ones we intend to try. And intend to try, yeah. yeah. because sooner so, or later, the intends become real. Yes. Yeah, they always happen. Uh, so, you know, do that. Uh, be industrious. Send that to us. Go to snakesandotters.com. You can find our uh, email addresses there. You know, Robert at snakesandotters.com, Martin at snakesandotters.com, and Francis at snakesandotters.com, or snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com, whatever. Send it to us there. And, you know, we'll give you a, a, a nice shout-out on the show when you do. And uh, if you guys never hear, if you somebody who's listening to this, you know, uh, two or three years after it was recorded, and you're like, hey, I don't remember they ever did that. Well, that's because, you know, somebody fell down on the job and didn't do it. But I believe in you, Autorites. Somebody will send this list to us. That's right. It's, exactly. Speaking of shout-outs, I'd like to give one myself. Oh, yeah, you mentioned this. Uh, yeah. An acquaintance of mine, John Z. from New Jersey. Uh, I got We got a message that... Uh, you, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You awesome. So awesome. again, an, uh, an acquaintance of mine in the computer field. Um, so a big shout out to John Z. Thank uh, you excellent. for subscribing, excellent. brother. Enjoy it. We'll, uh, we'll lift a glass to you. It's always nice when people we know are subscribers. Absolutely. Because, you know, I still cannot get Mrs. Robert to listen to the show. Oh, she I've... listens to inferior podcasts every oh, once in a while. Okay. But she's not a big podcast person to begin well, with. Well, I have I have forced Mrs. Francis to listen and she has dutifully done so. And she and she's not been critique critical of any of any of us, even myself. Uh, she actually has said she's enjoyed some of them. Yeah. Uh, she of says course. we she says we talk too much, but hey, we knew that. We do. Well, <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Martin likes the pop culture episodes in particular. Yeah. She's not as quite into the philosophical episodes and the history episodes. Uh, she's usually, you know, too busy to do much listening to anything. Right. Uh, so it's, it would have to be in the car or something when I'm making that's, her listen. That's when I, I've done that, too. But, uh, hey, Spotify, uh, I love that. Put it on downstairs and just kind of listen to it as we put her around. It's good stuff. You know, I think she would appreciate the Eastbound and Down episode from a few weeks ago. I may have to play that one for her. Well, if you're of a certain age, you'll get that one. Yes. If not, she, oh, that might she be loves Smokey and the Bandit. Well, I was going to say, yeah, if you grew up through that... Uh, with that time, you're going to get that one. That's for sure. If not, it's harder. 
Alright, so does that make pa- it... Pass the baton, as it time were. Time to hand off to Robert. The m- Mjolnir, which I don't have a Mjolnir here. Yes, uh, we don't have a hammer here. I, I need to get one of those. But we're, we're metaphorically passing Mjolnir to you to uh, right. smack dab dab baby home. That's your homework assignment, is to get on Amazon and find yourself a Mjolnir to I, I need to, to do that. That's exactly right, because it makes a great decoration <laughs> up here in the Baxter building. That's yes. right. That's Because, right. I mean, you already have the whole comic theme, Galactus, oh. Fantastic Four thing going anyway. You might as well throw in... Well, absolutely. Uh, I had here. one, but uh, I don't know where it went. Well, I want to get one that we can actually, you know, with some heft to yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I think we said this. Chris Hemsworth, his house is decorated with Mjolnir's. Yes, because he steals them every time he, there's a movie. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, he's, he he, people the send them to him all the time. And he's gotten to the point where his wife has said, no more. <laughs> I wonder how that went, though. Because apparently every time, he says, I'm now going to start collecting Stormbreakers. Because he didn't now, have Now, that's them. something to collect. I mean, that, you got, I mean, that's the... Over the mantle kind of weapon. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's he's a great guy. We love Chris Hemsworth, that's for sure. All right, so you know, gosh, there are so many different quotes that I could go with. Uh, I think I'm going to choose the one I think I'm going to go with is one that uh, honestly I really thought you might choose, Martin, because this is right up your alley okay. too. So this is uh, one I, we've spoken about this often. And I think it really will tie your your pieces together. Uh, before I do that, I always like to to to, uh, to recap what we've done. So, Martin, reread your quote. All right. When spring came, even the fall spring, there were no problems except where to be happiest. The only thing that could spoil a day was people, and if you could keep from making engagements, each day had no limits. People were always the limiters of happiness, except for the very few that were as good as spring itself. Right, right. So, yeah, really did like that one because that's a it really speaks to the introverts in us and, mm-hmm. and the need for an engaging set of people as opposed to the empty headed small talk kind of gathering. Yeah, more that, than just drinking buddies. Yeah, yeah. Got to have some intellectual engagement. Yeah. Amen. And so, Francis, uh, the most solid advice for a writer is this I think try to learn to breathe deeply, really to taste food when you eat. <laughs> And when you sleep, really to sleep. Try as much as possible to be wholly alive with all your might. And when you laugh, laugh like hell. And when you get angry, get good and angry. Try to be alive. You'll be dead soon enough. Right. Basically, live and pay attention. Amen. And, you know, be in the moment. Be in the arena. In the arena. Yeah, just steal from Dave Roosevelt. Yes. So, this is the one I came across. And I think this, this speaks to one of our core philosophies of life. We are all apprentices in a craft where no one ever becomes a master. Whoa. So, this speaks to me on a lot of levels. So, it speaks to me on the artistic level because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that uh, anybody who is an artist of any kind, whether you write, paint, draw, sculpt, uh, or if you want to go the, uh, the... uh, theatrical way, whether you're an actor or a uh, singer, or musician, whatever. Uh, artist is, is no longer just art. You know, everything is art. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But it's a recognition that we are not perfect, but that's what we are striving for. Uh, not just in our art, because, you know, uh, I don't spend nearly as much time with my art as I would like to, because, you know, again, all these damned obligations <laughs> we talked about. Yeah. Uh, but I do see that when I do something and, you know, there are times, uh, specific times in my life, I remember, you know, there's that sudden leap where you get better. And yeah, it's, a, it's an know, inspiration point where something, oh, and then everything's different after that. Yeah, whether it's an inspiration or just the, the specifically the craft is better, your technique is better. Yeah. Uh, you know, how you go about it, the, the, either the methods or the preparations or the materials doesn't matter. Uh, but life in general is that way, you know. We are not finished products. <laughs> Even when we're dead, you know, the finished product, uh, except for those few who die as saints, mm-hmm. uh, it, it happens, at least for those from the Catholic perspective, happens at the end of purgatory. You know, I'm shooting purgatory. I don't think I can make it first shot uh, getting to heaven. I'm shooting for purgatory. Uh, I'm hoping I'm there just one day less than Hitler. 
you know, <laughs> assuming he were to make it, you know, or, or Stalin or Mao. If any of those guys make it, as long as I'm there one day less, I feel like I've done something. Yeah. Um, said very tongue-in-cheek. Um, not that I think any of those guys are going to make it to purgatory. Uh, but the striving to be better uh, is, is the thing. Uh, as Shakespeare would say, the play is the thing. Mm-hmm. It, 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 to me, that's the same kind of thing. It, it's it's about um, how we are uh, intellectually engaged. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's is it the you know small talk that's meaningless and, and bores us quickly, or is it the deep discussions, or maybe not even just not even necessarily deep, but just enough to stimulate the mind, yeah. you know, to, to to think about things beyond a superficial talking point kind of way. Oh yeah, you know. It's about uh, taking time to enjoy what is going on in our lives. Not everything is enjoyable, but you know, hopefully as we are getting better at that craft of living, of being fully human, mm-hmm. we can find some joy and pleasure in things. Uh, uh, if we though, can't, then that's, that should be the goal. Well, you know, even, even the greatest suffering usually turns out to be a learning experience. A learning experience, and hopefully for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, often suffering is the result of, uh, well, suffering is almost always the result of choices we've made. Uh, sometimes that's not true. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, you get hit by a bus, that's, you know, the choice was maybe to be where the bus could hit you, but that's not really the same kind of thing. Right. Uh, a lot of times suffering is a choice uh, resulting from a choice to sacrifice. Uh, hopefully for us it's because it's, we've sacrificed for others for we, friends and family we are very much three people who advocate free will your decisions are your life yes you know your decisions have consequences uh-huh. so therefore the, some deliberate action must be taken in making those choices yeah just oh, because yeah. you can do a thing does not mean you should Right, and it's up to you to figure. And just that because out. a thing happens your, doesn't mean it was preordained. Yeah, your right. life is not just a tempest of outside forces. Your life is your own. That's right. That's that's a a line in the sand for snakes and otters. Yes, Calvinists out there are saying, "No, you're totally wrong." You know, everything God has decided how everything well, is going to play out, and you have no choice in that, even though you think you do, which I think is the coolest kind of God you could possibly yeah, why, imagine. Why would, we, why, would, why would anybody believe in that? I really cannot wrap my head around that. We can extend uh, the flying finger of friendship to that philosophy very easily. Yeah. yeah and, you know, if I'm wrong, then, well, God's already decided I'm wrong about it, and there's nothing I can do yeah. about it. So, yes, I'll, yeah. I'll choose to go about it this way. If you choose not to make a choice, you're still... You've still chosen. You're still chosen. Right. And you it's not to say that those who are Calvinists... Go, uh, if you choose not to decide, you have still made a choice. There you yes. go. That's right. and, you know, it's not to say that Calvinists don't go about their lives making decisions. They just believe God has already decided what they're going to decide and presented it to them as if it were their own idea. And again, it just seems so stupid to me. But no offense to, to you, Calvinists. It's just you're just damn wrong. That's all I got to say. But oh, yes, the metaphorical finger flying. Finger. Yeah. So it, it to me that's the you know there is no craft in that kind of a yeah. life. There is no bettering yourself in that kind of life because you have no control in that kind of life. Ding, ding, ding. There is no craft in that life. And dare I say it, without craft, in some form or profession, life could be rendered irrelevant, meaningless, not worth living. Certainly empty. Empty, okay. Yes. It's lacking in at least one or two ways and possibly in almost every way that makes life worth living. Because... Again, he, he's got another quote, um, and I don't have it right here, but basically... Uh, oh, no, here it is. There's nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Yeah, we use, that's the one we used before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, Sorry, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. So when you, when you, let's pull that, you know, reach back to that, not reach around, but reach back, and, and pull that Francis quote uh, up. It really is the same kind of thing. It, they're uh, kind of two sides of the same coin. Well, how do you become superior to former self? It's improving the craft of being fully human. That's right. And I know that's a phrase I really like, that being fully human, because to me that means being as good in the capital G sense, uh, you know, living a life of grace, which is how you're able to be good. You know, if you come from from a theological perspective, nothing that is good comes from anywhere else but God. 
the mm -hmm. devil does not cause good things to happen. Because if good things happen and he gets something out of it, then it didn't go to a good purpose. You know, it, why you do things is just as important of, of the doing at times. That's right. Uh, but yeah, the craft, you know, we all like something that's well done. Mm -hmm. What's better than a well crafted life? Mm -hmm. A well crafted life. Yeah. Well, That's think, awesome, right? I would think Hemingway would certainly qualify with that. Even in many he, ways, I, you know, in many it's ways, he was very flawed. Oh yeah. yes, we'll talk about that next episode. He, he certainly, obviously, flawed. recognized the, the the necessity to be better. Oh yeah, whether absolutely. or not he achieves, whether or not any of us achieve, well, that yeah, he, is well, the question. Well, yeah, and he struggled with depression a lot. He usually called it the black dog. Yes, and leashing the black dog was something he constantly. Some say that. This was as a result of some uh, the injuries that he had suffered. He had at least three occasions where he was certainly concussed and had brain injuries, uh, and that cumulatively led to issues later in life. Which there are some that think that's what uh, enabled him to what uh, he ultimately committed suicide. Yeah, but he, you know the black dog. I honestly believe that it is the curse of the thinking man. Oh, you're exactly yeah. right. Yes, because those again. Uh, I don't mean introvert versus extrovert here, because extroverts can be thinkers too. Sure. Uh, but the thinking man, like a Hemingway, who, you know, obviously is very deep, but, you know, he finds some ways to express this. Um, you find a lot of creatives are uh, a struggle with yeah. depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, those of us that, that deal with things beyond the superficial, look to the meaning of things. Yeah. That can be overwhelming for some people. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a reason that that's the, ignorance is bliss is, is you know bliss? a long time canard. I mean, because right. there is something to that, and it's yeah. not just ignorance of responsibility because there's that too, but ignorance of meaning. You know, it, it, it's a lot easier if you don't realize how small you are in the grand scheme of things. Yet at the same time, how much of an impact you can have. Yeah. You know, our impact can be massively disproportionate to our yeah. uh, our, our small part in things. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. that's a sobering thought as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's easy to see. If you live as fully as, he, as he's suggesting in my quote, then of course that's going to, you know, you're going to see things at a very different rate. And that gets overwhelming to our mortal, finite right. minds. Well, and, and for certainly, you know, for guys like us, I know that Francis and I, Francis and I have talked uh, in the past, you know, about the black dog and whether or not, you know, how much of an effect that has on us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a sometimes that overwhelming responsibility of things that you have to do, things that you want to do. You know, it's it can be massive, mm -hmm. and when things don't go the way you want, because nothing ever goes exactly the way you want it. Uh, if they do, you don't have big enough goals. Uh, you're not reaching high enough. Uh, you know, it, it is a very real thing, and it's not something that's necessarily... A, you know, lead you to clinical depression where you've got to be on an antidepressants and check yourself into rehab or something. But it can certainly affect your life and the life of mm -hmm. the people around you. Yep. And you know, when you go back to the to the craft part of this, to me it's all of that kind of goes hand in hand because you have to you cannot attempt to get better without having to deal with that black dog as well. Yeah, absolutely. You really can't. Uh -huh. And in many respects, uh, the creative act itself is an attempt to mitigate that. Yes. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's both an attempt to mitigate it, <clears throat> an attempt to mitigate it, but at the same time also a source of it. Uh, so I, there's an irony for you, that paradox. Yes. We love, you know, the wisdom is in paradox. It is reaching to be like God uh -huh. in the creative sense, mm -hmm. yet recognizing how far, how far you fall short. That's right, and never can be. And never can be. And for some, that's not acceptable. Uh, I think that's where the suicides yeah. tend to tend to come. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I, practically every great artist that I can think of, artist and writer, has dealt with it. Michelangelo, mm -hmm. Van Gogh, right? From you know, Hemingway, right? Stephen King. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at musicians. Kurt Cobain. Oh, He's yeah, the poster that's... child for it for musicians. Right. Uh, you know, people that creatively, sometimes economically, had it all. Uh, certainly, Van Gogh did not have it economically. And creatively, he wasn't really recognized in his own <laughs> yeah, lifetime. Yeah, in his lifetime. They came later, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, but he, he 
he ex- he worked at the craft. He expressed it, but you know the lack of any kind of positive feedback probably is what did him in the most. But he also had that the, the issues that went with that, and the, probably the lack of recognition just exacerbated it. And of course, Michelangelo had his famous uh, fights with the Pope. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, if you're going to have a fight with anybody and be able to go toe to toe, and it's the Pope, you are damn good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, that's just it, he, he's still the master in many ways. Yeah. So, right. anyways, that's I don't know. I can say much more without just you know pummeling the expired equine there. Well, we, we can continue this. We'll, next we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll pick up on that when we talk about him. Yeah, well, yeah I mean, for next, the next episode. You know, next episode. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, talk about more about the man himself. Uh, in many respects, we've done a lot of that here already, which I thought was really well. Cool. That's uh, you know unavoidable to to, yeah. to give some context, right? And, and I, context I, is king. That's right. And I think it actually thought Jack Kirby was king, but that's another subject. Uh, but we're uh, next episode. We're going to be talking about Hemingway the Man, uh, his history, uh, more about his works, uh, and get really deep into the, his craft and why he really is so great. And uh, listeners, if you haven't read him, I urge you to do so. It's real easy to do. He's very accessible, and that's what makes him so great. We're going to talk all about him next episode. So be here. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes publish every Friday at noon Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a comment or review because that helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.